we'll talk again about diffusions, but uh, yet from another perspective, this time focusing on their generalization properties. Hi, everyone. Um, so this is, I'm going to talk about a recent work that we just presented at ICLR two weeks ago. Uh, it's a collaboration with Florentine Gust, who is in the audience, and Eero Simoncelli and Stefan Malav. And the topic is generalization versus memorization in diffusion models. Um, Okay, so these are some images generated by a diffusion model. And at this point, you've all seen many high quality large images generated by these models. Uh, diffusion models sample from, as you know, sample from learned densities. Uh, but we all learned early on in probability 101 that it's impossible to learn densities in high dimensions because of the curse of dimensionality. Um, and the reason is that, or what case of dimensionality says, is that the number of data points that you need grows exponentially with dimensionality. So to give you a concrete example, for a, diffu uh, for a distribution of 8-bit images uh, of size 80 by 80, so these are small images, uh, the number of bins in, in a histogram that we use to estimate the, or the approximate the, the density uh, is 256 to the power of 6400. So this is larger than the number of atoms in the universe and larger than any like, real data set that we can collect. Um, so the question is, how is it that diffusion models uh, can do it? Uh, one possibility is that maybe they are just memorizing the training examples in the, uh, in the set. Uh, in that case, the learned density is just a collection of delta functions. So in this cartoon, I'm showing the real underlying, the true underlying distribution with this like one dimensional manifold, the, the black curve, and the learned density is shown by this uh, collection of red delta functions. And some recent work in the literature, which I'm showing two examples of here, have shown that this is actually what some of the diffusion models, some of the state of the art diffusion models do. Uh, the first case on the left, uh, you see the, uh, the generated sample, which is almost an exact replication of one of the images in the train set. And um, the second case, in the second paper, uh, the, the top row shows some generated samples, and you see regions in each one of these examples that are replications of images in the train set. The second possibility is that the diffusion model is um, learning a continuous model of the underlying distribution. Uh, so in other words, it's generalizing beyond the training examples. So in this work, we ask um, which one of these two strategies do diffusion models take? Which one is the case? The short answer is both. Uh, sometimes they memorize and sometimes they generalize. But the, gen the, the memorization case is not interesting. So we focus on the generalization case and we ask, how is it that they can generalize despite the curse of dimensionality with finite data? All right, so I'm going to give you a brief review of diffusion models. It's going to be a little bit different from a different perspective, basically from a denoiser perspective, uh, which we proposed around the same time that diffusion models came out. Um, so diffusion models are based on denoisers. So a deep neural net, no, net denoiser takes a noisy image Y, which is the sum of a clean image X and Z, which is a sample of Gaussian white noise. And the standard deviation of the Gaussian white noise varies in a wide range from, from zero to one. And then they are trained to uh, remove the noise by minimizing mean square error. And they, uh, they return a denoised image F hat of Y. So then after the denoiser is learned, it's applied partially and iteratively, starting from a sample of noise to generate an image. And obviously, if you start from a different sample of noise, you end up on a different image. Okay, but what does this have to do with 
sampling, what does denoising have to do with sampling from a density? Right, so why does this work? The magic lies in this equation, uh, which is famous or like attributed to Tweedy and Miyasawa, um, which uh, basically tells us, the, uh, tells us the relationship between denoising and the density. Okay? Uh, so from the Bayesian perspective, we know that the optimal denoiser from uh, MMSC point of view, right, if you want to minimize mean square error, uh, the optimal denoiser, F star, is simply the conditional mean of the posterior distribution, right? Is this integral. Now, Tweedy and Miyasawa converted this integral to this other equation which does not contain an integral, so it's great computationally, it has a gradient, right? So basically this tells us that the optimal denoiser is precisely related to the gradient of the log of the density of noisy images. So, if you want to remove noise from Y, in one step, it's enough to just follow the direction of the gradient, uh, go uphill um, uh, on the density of noisy images. Right? The only thing here is that this is the density of noisy images. We are interested in the density of clean images. But the, the relationship between these two densities is very simple. Right? In, in the beginning, we said that we, the noisy image is the sum of the clean image and a sample of noise. So we are adding two random variables in, which are independent. So their distribution is just convolving together, right? So we have like a co very complicated distribution, Px, that is convolved with the uh, Gaussian distribution. And the, the, uh, so the, the, uh, the probability of y is just a blurred or diffused version of probability of x. And the level of diffusion or like blur depends on sigma, uh, the standard deviation of the noise. So, uh, with varying levels of added noise, we basically have a family of a scalar space representation of Px, right? Which is very similar to the, or equivalent to the uh, temporal evolution of a uh, diffusion process, right? So now, when we learn a denoiser, f hat, uh, this f hat, this learned denoiser approximates this um, optimal denoiser, F star, and the gradient of the log of the learned density, right? So then, conveniently, we can use this gradient, uh, which is presented in the form of the denoiser, in a course-to-find gradient ascent algorithm to sample from this density that is embedded in the denoiser. Right? But what is this density? We do not have direct access to the density, we only see individual samples from the density. So how can we assess from these individual samples uh, uh, what type of density the denoiser learned, right? Back to the original question, is it a, a discrete collection of delta functions or is it a continuous model of the underlying distribution? Okay. So to answer this question, uh, we study the behavior of diffusion model as a, a function of the training set size. Okay, so we train six diffusion models on increasingly growing training set sizes from one to 100,000. And then we sample from each. And I'm showing one sample from each one of these models here. So we have six samples. Now we can go back to each training set and find the closest image in Euclidean terms, in Euclidean distance terms, to each one of these samples. So as, as you can see, when the training set size is small, uh, the, all of these samples are memorized. They are memorized versions of the training examples, right? But when the training set size is large, it's 100,000, the generated sample is novel. It's not the same as the training example, uh, any training example and it's high quality. And then in between, um, the, the model either generates low quality sample or it patches together regions of different examples in the training set. So here I'm highlighting uh, a region where it's coming from a different um, training example, like the, that corner of the image. Okay, so now, we're gonna get a new set of data points, a new batch of images that we haven't used, um, 
and it's not overlapping with the previous batch that we used, and we repeat the experiment. We, um, we train six new models uh, on this new data and sample uh, images, which you are see seeing on the third row. Again, we go and compare these samples with the closest examples in the training set. And again, you see that they are memorized for the small training set size. But then now, look at the, the largest uh, training set size, 100K. When we start from the, initial, from the same initial point, surprisingly, this new model generates the same example, although it's been trained on a completely different data set. So this means that the variance, the model variance, is basically going to zero. They are, you, are, uh, you, you have trained two models on two different data sets, right? But they ended up learning the same denoisers and basically the same densities. OK, so back to my original question is, uh, do diffusion models uh, memorize or generalize? The answer is both. With little data, they memorize. And with lots of data, they generalize. So this was um, anecdotal. We want to see that this was not just a fluke, and it happens all the time. So we just repeat the same experiment with um, more initialization. So with here, I'm showing a histogram of similarity scores, uh, basically two histograms, the blue one and the orange one. Uh, similarity scores between pairs of images. So the blue histograms, the blue histogram here shows the similarity score between sa the sample A and sample B. Each one is generated by one model, which are trained on 10 images. Right? And as you can see, the similarity is quite low because the, sam the, distribution, the data sets are not overlapping, so uh, they are not similar to each other. And to, um, um, also, the, the orange histogra histogram shows the similarity score between the sample and the closest image in the training set. And as you can see, it's concentrated around one for most images, which means that it's just getting, uh, it's perfectly memorizing um, images, and the samples are exactly the same as the closest training examples, right? So we can make the same histogram for our, our other models as well. And as you go from left to right, you see that the similarity between the score, between the pairs of images grows, right? And at the end, it concentrates around one, which means that the samples generated uh, by these two models are very similar. And they are dissimilar to the tr examples in the train set. Right? OK, so this, this is an interesting observation. How, how is it that the neural network can enter this generalization regime with finite data, with actually really small data set compared to what we needed if um, the, considering the curse of dimensionality, right? So uh, there must be really good, strong inductive biases uh, in these networks that lead to early generalization. So now the question is, what are those inductive biases? OK, so to study the inductive biases and understand what these networks are doing, we are going to step back to the classical framework of uh, denoising, uh, which consists of three steps. So the first step is take the noisy image and transform it to a basis where noise and signal have different representation. In particular, um, they are separable. Then suppress the noise using a shrinkage function applied to the coefficients in this basis, and then transform back to the pixel domain. Um, so this is very simple, but, but the trick is to find a basis where the image has a compact representation. So whenever we suppress the noise, we don't lose a lot of the signal, and we don't preserve a lot of the noise. So let's look at a few historical examples of uh, this idea of uh, shrinkage in a basis for denoising. The first example is the Wiener filter, which is basically the first effective denoiser. And in this case, the, the basis is the Fourier basis. It's fixed. And the reason that it makes sense to use Fourier basis is that for white Gaussian noise, we know that on average, noise has the same power everywhere for all frequencies. 
But empirically, we know that images, natural images, have a 1 over k, k being the frequency spectrum. So um, low frequencies have higher power. Right? So Wiener filter takes advantage of this difference in average representation and defines the shrinkage uh, factors which basically uh, suppress the high frequencies right, more and preserve low frequencies that are above the noise level. Uh, they pre it pre preserves them more. Um, but note that in, in this case, the basis is fixed and the shrinkage factors are also fixed. Right? They don't depend on the input. Then, so that was like in 1940, around 1940, then um, 50 years after that, people realized that um, images have a more compact representation in wavelet domain. So it means that they can, you can achieve better denoising in wavelet uh, basis. So um, uh, that's good. Not only that, but also they realized that you can make the shrinkage factors um, dependent on the input image. So you can make the shrinkage factors adaptive, right? So one simple example of making shrinkage factors adaptive is hard thresholding, where we basically set a threshold and we say whatever is below, whatever coefficient in wavelet domain is below this threshold, we are going to suppress it, and whatever is above that, we are going to keep it, right? So, but, but the coefficients come from individual images, so it's, it's dependent on the input image, so it's adaptive. Now, um, it turns out that we can interpret deep neural network denoisers in the same way, in the, in the sense of shrinkage in a basis. But in this case, not only the shrinkage factors are adaptive, but also the basis is adaptive as well. So that's why these networks are so powerful. Uh, okay, so let's see how we do that. The denoiser mapping that is learned, f hat, is, local, is a locally linear function. So we can rewrite it in terms of the Jacobian times, with respect to the input, times the input. And we have shown in previous work that um, this Jacobian is nearly symmetric, so we can express it in terms of eigen decomposition. So let's see what, how the denoising is happening here. You have a noisy image y. It's taken to this eigen basis which is adaptive to the underlying image. Right? Then it's multiplied by the eigenvalue, uh, which is basically a shrinkage factor. Uh, they're mostly between 0 and 1. And these are also adaptive to the underlying image. And then you transform back the image to the uh, pixel domain. Okay. So now let's look at an example. Um, here we have like an image, a, a noisy image that is denoised, and we, we see this analysis, this eigen, eigen analysis for it. The first thing to look at is the decay of the eigenvalues. So as you can see, the eigenvalues, it, it decays pretty fast. Most of them are zero or near zero. So what does this mean? It means that the representation is quite compact. So it's, it's able, the basis is, is able to compress the image into a handful of dimensions. So now look, let's look at this uh, representation, this, this basis. Uh, these are some of the top eigenvectors of the basis, which are shown as each, each image is uh, one eigenvector. Um, and there are two things to notice here. First, they are adaptive. Right? So they adapt to the underlying content of the image. Uh, you can see the features of the face in the image. And if I change the test image, I'm going to get new eigenvectors. And the second property is that you see oscillatory patterns um, in, in these vectors. There are two types of oscillatory patterns. One is like one-dimensional one um, uh, oscillatory patterns along the contours of the face. And then there are two-dimensional oscill oscillatory patterns in the background foreground regions. So we call this type of basis geometry adaptive harmonic basis. It's adaptive to the geometry of the image, and it has this dual harmonic structure. Okay? So with this observation, we form a hypothesis. D 
deep neural network denoisers have inductive biases towards learning gaps, this, this, type, of, this type of basis. Now, how do we test this hypothesis? Um, for the general case of natural images, we don't know what is the optimal denoiser. So we have to resort to um, synthetic images where we know what is the optimal solution. So here we are going to look at two uh, classes of synthetic images. In one case, the uh, GABs, the GAB basis, is an optimal um, uh, uh, basis. And in, other, in another case, the GAB basis is not the optimal, it's suboptimal basis. And we are going to see that empirically the denoiser always ends up with GAB. And that's what I mean by inductive bias. So but inductive bias towards learning gaps means that the network ends up learning gaps all the time, whether it's optimal or not. Okay. All right, so the first case, the geometric C alpha image. Um, these are some examples of, of this type of images. Um, and these are basically, um, these images consist of regular contours on regular backgrounds. And the level of regularity, as you can see in these uh, images, ch changes with alpha. So as you increase alpha, the image becomes more regular. So mathematicians have shown that you can achieve optimal denoi denoising performance for this type of image in, in some kinds of gap spaces. So now let's see what the denoiser does. What can we learn? Okay, so here is some of the top vectors in the eigenbasis um, of, uh, of a denoiser that is trained on C alpha images. And here, as you can see, the oscillating patterns along the contours and in the background foreground regions are a lot more obvious. Um, but this is still uh, uh, qualitative. We want to make this more concrete and quantitative. Um, so, thankfully, we know in, in terms of the slope of the, of the denoising performance, what is, what is optimal. Uh, so, again, mathematicians have worked that out for, for us. Um, so, this is a performance plot, a, a denoising performance plot, PSNR, input PSNR and output PSNR. And I'm showing the optimal performance uh, with dashed lines um, and um, the, basically the optimal, optimal slope is alpha divided by alpha plus one. Okay. And it can, be, it, it can be achieved in, for example, a, a banded um, uh, space. Uh, and on the other side, I'm showing the empirical performance with these solid lines. Okay. So as you can see, the empirical performance matches perfectly the uh, optimal performance. So it means that the deep net learns a gap basis and achieves optimal performance uh, when it is the optimal thing to do. So the first test that we wanted is passed. So can I ask a quick yeah. question? It's a clarifying question, actually, because I didn't understand how the net was learned that represents the basis. Oh, it's just a denoiser. So uh, it's back to the, right. yeah, this one. It's this one. So, but it is, only, that one is trained only on C alpha images, right? And, and the loss function is mean square. Yeah. Um, yeah, and it's trained on all different levels of alpha. Uh, sorry, no means. Okay. All right, so the first test is passed. Um, now, the second test, um, for the second test, we take this data set of disk images, uh, which are, we, we're seeing some of the examples of the data set here. Uh, these are uh, translating disks that change in size. So um, they all lie on a five-dimensional manifold uh, and the parameters of the manifolds are defined by the vertical and horizontal position of the disk, uh, the size of the disk or the radius of the disk, and the foreground and background intensities. Okay? So now we train an, a new denoiser on this data set. 
Um, and first, we ask, what is the optimal solution in this case for denoising? For small le levels of noise, the optimal denoising solution is to just take the noisy image and project it back onto this manifold. Okay? Um, so take this uh, clean image, for example. The tangent plane at the point of this clean image on the manifold is defined by taking the derivative with respect the, of the image with respect to those five variables, right? And the resulting vectors I'm showing here. Uh, and you can see that like you have vertical translation, horizontal translation at the end, you have the changes in intensity and the change in the radius, right? So these five vectors span the tangent plane on the manifold at that point. Okay? So from a um, shrinkage in a basis point of view, uh, the basis consists of these five vectors on the top with shrinkage factors of one, and then the rest of the basis is arbitrary. It can be anything because it's not constrained, but importantly, the shrinkage factors are, uh, have to be zero, right? Uh, because it's a projection. So now let's look at the empirical basis that is learned by the denoiser. First, the top five vectors in the empirical basis match closely the optimal ones. Right? Uh, and importantly, the shrinkage factors are near one. Now, let's look at the next five vectors. The next five vectors, surprisingly, are not arbitrary. They have um, oscillating patterns along the contours and in the background regions. They look like GABS vectors. And importantly, they don't have um, uh, shrinkage values of zero. So what does this mean in terms of optimality? It means that the, the solution that the network comes up with is suboptimal in this case. Because like we said, noise, Gaussian white noise has power in all directions. So whatever component of the noise that is in these five directions is going to be preserved, which results in more error. Right? So the next test is also passed. Um, Deep nets learn gaps, even if it's the suboptimal solution. Okay. So to sum up, um, diffusion models can transition from memorization to generalization with large enough training set sizes. Um, the, although this, um, this large enough training set size is still very tiny compared to the number of data points that you need uh, if you didn't have any hypothesis or uh, any inductive biases in the network. Uh, generalization is a strong. It means that the model variance tends to zero. Uh, two denoisers trained on non-overlapping training sets converge to nearly the same function. And finally, generalization is due to an inductive bias corresponding to shrinkage in a geometry adaptive harmonic basis, which we call gap, like we came up with this name. All right, thank you. And you can find the paper and on open review. Do we have questions? Oh, one short technical question. So you said it's unique because it achieves the same score as the gap, which is optimal in that case. Why do I know that it's like the only basis there exists? Are they unique in some sense? Um, it's not, you mean for the C-alpha case? Be, no, for the, because the two, for, the, for your testing hypothesis, you have first the one where gap is optimal, mm -hmm. and you say that the neural net achieves the same right. performance, yeah, yeah. and then you conclude that it's necessarily the same basis oh, I it's see, using. I, see. I was yeah, just wondering yeah. like, yeah, if it's yeah, yeah, yeah. that yeah. obvious. Yeah, so that's a good question. So we didn't um, define gaps uh, mathematically and precisely. That was uh, the quantitative statement is about optimality in terms of performance slope. Uh, but because qualitatively we also observe that the bases look like gaps, we make the, the conclusion that um, the, the, this optimal performance is achieved in a gap basis, which in theory we know that is achievable in gap spaces such as bandits.
Thanks for the very cool talk and uh, results. Uh, it's more like a clarifying question. What's maybe you said it? What's the architecture that you? Oh, what's I the didn't say network? it. Uh, yeah, Sorry. it's a it's the original unit architecture. Uh, the result that I was showing here is just the unit architecture. Okay. Uh, we have like in the supplementary we we have results for another architecture, another denoiser called uh, DNCNN or BFCNN, okay. which is a dense network without any subsampling. And from, also from learning gaps. Yes, yes. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Hi, thanks for a very cool talk. Um, I'm just curious, in the first part of the presentation, you say you use the Euclidean distance to find the nearest neighbor yeah. of the picture. Like, I get that, you know, like when the data set is quite small, like this, this might be sufficient, but like, can you guarantee that this is gonna, uh, you know, make sure that you don't actually, like, miss out on having the exact image in generation? Mm -hmm. Like, why do you use Euclidean distance, like, and not something else? Um, yeah, so we basically measured the distances in the pixel domain, um, and we assumed that the Euclidean distance or the cosine similarity is the, strict, the most strict form of similarity. Um, so that's what we used. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, maybe I missed this, but have, uh, have you closed the loop and shown that the the transition you observed in the first part of the talk from mm -hmm. memorization to generalization is associated with the network's learning gaps? Mm -hmm. Like when they memorize, they don't learn gaps, and that's like the secret oh, sauce you need to right, right. to generalize. Mm -hmm. or is that not what um, you're trying to say? Yeah. No. Actually, like so, if you look at the eigen uh, vectors of the uh, the first case, like when you have only one image in the training set. Um, those also show gaps um, properties. So uh, in that case, the optimal solution, when you have like one image, uh, the optimal solution is to just, um, uh, the, the basically the prior is just a ray going through the origin. So it's just one line, it's the 1D manifold. And uh, the optimal solution is to project back onto, onto that. But what we see is that we have four directions, the four top directions in the basis are non-zero. Uh, and that's like similar to the case of the disks. Um, so the, the network is not capable to sh shrink the, all the factors to zero except that first one. Yeah. Cool. And Thanks. then in the transition phase, the um, the gap it, you still see like some sort of like gap looking uh, vectors, but they are all over the place um, until like you enter the generalization phase and they they look good. That's fine. Thanks. I wanted to ask, so the first experiment you showed kind of shows that the denoise you, you learn is not so sensitive to the training set. Um, do you know how sensitive it is to the other hyperparameter choices of the diffusion model? Such as what? Uh, such as, for instance, like the number of steps that you take uh, or like the schedule. Yeah, Yeah. so those are all, all the learning phase uh, hyperparameters. Um, we did not really experiment with those. So what we did was just train the denoisers and wait until the loss plateaus. Uh, and that was um, basically, that was it for us, yeah. Thank you. Okay, any last questions? Well, if not, let's thank Zara again. Thank you.